Welcome to Digital Lunch Break Science. I'm Jim Blow. I'm the Administrative Coordinator here at Science Museum of Virginia and your host for Lunch Break Science. Uh, I'm also a historian and the museum will on occasion let me off the chain to talk about crazy things like the presentation I'm going to give you today. I specialize in kind of morbid and weird stories about science. Uh, so today I'm going to be presenting uh, a look to die for when arsenic was in fashion. And uh, so let's go ahead and get things kicked off. So arsenic has been known as the king of poisons or the poison of kings. Uh, so this would be something that throughout history, uh, if you wanted to say bump off a relative to get your inheritance, or if you were a ruler and you want to get rid of someone troublesome, uh, you might turn to arsenic for reasons that I'm going to talk about here. Uh, so as I mentioned, arsenic is number 33 on the periodic table, and in its pure metallic form, it looks like this. Now, arsenic is not a metal. It's what's called a metalloid, which means it has some of the characteristics, but not all of the characteristics of a metal. Uh, for one thing, arsenic does not melt. When it's heated, it undergoes a process called sublimation, where it goes directly from a solid to a gas. It doesn't pass into a liquid form. And that's going to be important for some stuff I'm going to talk about later on. Uh, but you typically will not find arsenic just hanging around like this uh, in the pure metallic form. Usually arsenic will be hanging around with other elements. Uh, so this is a copper arsenate mineral right here. Uh, oftentimes it will be found hanging around with sulfur, uh, like with this right here. This is realgar and another mineral called orpiment, this beautiful yellow here. Uh, those are both examples of arsenic hanging around with sulfur. Uh, so they figured out in ancient times, uh, thanks to this guy Hippocrates, uh, that you could use arsenic uh, containing minerals like realgar and orpiment. Uh, you could use those to treat skin problems, uh, but they realized that it was not something you wanted to take internally because it was toxic. Uh, but realgar, orpiments, you couldn't really use those to poison somebody with. It would have been very conspicuous. However, at some point, we're not really sure when, someone discovered this stuff right here. And this is arsenic trioxide, or what they call white arsenic. Uh, so if you read like Agatha Christie or something like that, and she's talking about poisoning someone with arsenic, this right here would be what would be used. Uh, so this dissolved very readily in warm liquids. Uh, it couldn't be tasted, you can't smell it, um, but it was absolutely deadly when taken internally in sufficient amounts. Uh, so it was very easy to obtain for a very long time. You could just walk into a chemist shop and pick up some white arsenic, and people did that all the time for either getting rid of rats or, as I said, getting rid of troublesome relatives or even as a method of suicide. Uh, so this is a young poet named Thomas Chatterton, and this picture is from the 1850s, from what was called the Romantic Period. Uh, so you can see down there at the bottom is an empty vial. Uh, so this young man has unfortunately committed suicide, uh, which you can see it's depicted very beautifully with a light streaming through the window, and it looks like a very peaceful way to die. Taking arsenic internally is not a very peaceful way to die. It's an irritant poison. Uh, it causes violent uh, gastrointestinal symptoms vomiting, diarrhea, cramping. It's extremely painful, extremely bad way to go out. If you've read Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert, the title character actually commits suicide with arsenic and Flaubert very accurately describes how that process went and it would not look at all like this. Uh, so let's continue on. So I mentioned if you wanted to get a troublesome relative out of the way, arsenic would be a great way to do it. And that actually happened here in Richmond in 1806. This gentleman here is George Wythe. Uh, so George Wythe was the first American law professor at William and Mary, and he was actually the tutor and the mentor to some folks you may have heard of, uh, John Marshall, Henry Clay, James Madison, and Thomas Jefferson. All of those were his students, and he is actually one of the signers from the Virginia Declaration of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, so George Wythe was very well thought of. He was a very beloved figure. And uh, he, after his wife died, he moved here to Richmond, and uh, he actually had a house here in the city. And he had this young nephew, a man named George Wiss Sweeney, 
who was just always getting into trouble. He had a serious gambling problem, and there were many gambling dens here in Richmond back in the day. It was kind of a wild town. Uh, so the nephew, George, uh, he would be stealing the judge's law books and pawning them to get money to pay his gambling debts. Uh, he apparently owed money to some very unpleasant people. Uh, and every time this would happen, uh, the judge would just, it's okay, he's going to grow out of it. Uh, because he was hoping that George would, in fact, grow out of it, because George with Sweeney was George with's heir. Uh, so eventually what ends up happening one morning is uh, the nephew comes down to the kitchen. He's bothering the housekeeper. Just hurry up and make me some toast so I can leave. Well, the housekeeper is in the middle of making breakfast for Judge Wythe. Uh, so the housekeeper sees the nephew fiddling around with the coffee pot, doesn't think anything of it. Then the nephew throws a little piece of paper into the kitchen fire and hastily runs out the door. So the housekeeper serves the judge his breakfast and his coffee, and then she sits down to have breakfast with her son. Very shortly thereafter, all three of them become violently ill. Uh, so the judge right off decides that he's been poisoned by his nephew, and he's so convinced of it that he calls his lawyer to his bedside to get the nephew written out of the will. Uh, so the judge's doctor said, no, you probably haven't been poisoned. This could simply be cholera. Well, there was no cholera in Virginia at the time in 1806, but nobody really knew that because they didn't really know how cholera was transmitted. Uh, but the judge was adamant that he'd been poisoned. By the way, it's worth noting one of those doctors uh, was a man named James Fushi. Uh, so if you've seen Fushi Street, uh, Dr. Fushi was also the mayor of Richmond at one time. But at this point in time, he was Judge Wood's doctor. Uh, so the judge eventually died a lingering painful death after 14 days. The nephew was brought to trial, uh, but he was acquitted. And the reason he was acquitted is because the only witness to him fiddling with the coffee pot was the housekeeper, who was African-American. Under Virginia law at that time, an African-American could not give testimony in court against a white person. Sadly enough, one of the people who advocated to have that law changed was George Wythe. Uh, so the nephew was acquitted, but he was advised to never again show his face in the Commonwealth of Virginia, which he did not. He was never really heard from again. Uh, but that's just an example of how it could happen. Uh, arsenic poisoning was frequently mistaken for a number of other gastrointestinal illnesses. Foodborne illness was really endemic at the time, uh, so it would not be unusual for someone to get sick from bad food or bad water. Uh, so it was a great way to get away with murder because there wasn't really accurate tests for arsenic that could be easily done to prove that someone had been poisoned until this gentleman here came up with a test. And this is James Marsh. Now, James Marsh was a Scottish chemist, and he was called to court in 1832 to test a sample of food uh, in a murder trial. Uh, so James Marsh did the best chemical tests he knew, but he could not produce a sample that could clearly demonstrate the presence of arsenic uh, because by the time he got it to court, the sample had simply dissipated. So Marsh decides he's going to come up with a better test and this is not going to happen again. So he does come up with this test called the Marsh test, uh, which is a fairly complicated test. You really had to be on point with your chemistry to know how to perform the Marsh test. Uh, so what ended up happening, there was a famous trial in France uh, called the Lafarge trial. So this is Marie Lafarge, and Marie was accused of poisoning her husband with arsenic. Uh, so some chemists came out to the court, and they ran the Marsh test on the samples that were provided to them, and they could not detect the presence of arsenic. Well, the judge was so positive that this woman had poisoned her husband that he contacted this gentleman, Matthew Orfila. Uh, so Matthew Orfila is considered the father of forensic chemistry. Uh, so Matthew Orfila came out and he ran the Marsh test and did come up with samples of arsenic. Uh, and he said the Marsh test worked absolutely fine. The problem was your chemist didn't know how to do it properly. So at this point in 1840, they do have a reliable scientific test to detect the presence of arsenic, and it relied on the fact that arsenic sublimates and turns directly into a gas when it's heated. Uh, so they could collect that basically on a little strip of copper uh, when they performed the Marsh test. Uh, but again, you kind of had to be up on your chemistry. It wasn't something that just anyone could do. 
So it was still fairly easy at this point to get away with poisoning someone with arsenic if you needed to get someone out of the way. And it happened all the time, either accidentally or on purpose. Arsenic had a number of applications uh, besides just as a poison, a uh, number of industrial applications and in things like pigments. Uh, so this right here, if anyone recognizes this young lady, you can go ahead and type it in the chat. Uh, but you can see she's wearing this beautiful green dress. And this particular painting was done in 1855. And yes, absolutely, that is Queen Victoria as a young lady. Uh, so I mentioned earlier about the Romantic period. Uh, this was a response to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and the scientific revolution, uh, where these romantic poets kind of became worried that eventually all the mysteries in nature would be reduced basically down to math, uh, and all of the mystery and the, the wonder would be taken out of nature. Uh, so things like wearing the color green and wearing artificial flowers, uh, like Queen Victoria is doing here, became very popular. Uh, the problem was making a green pigment that was color fast was really, really difficult to do until a gentleman came up with a way to make a pigment that I'm gonna talk about how that worked. But these green pigments would end up in everything. As I mentioned already, they were in cloth. Uh, so if you look at this picture here, as I mentioned, arsenic being associated with the green pigment, which one of these did you, these dresses would you think would contain arsenic? It's a trick question. They all had arsenic in them. Uh, arsenic was used to make more than just a green pigment. But even the ink that was on this page would have contained arsenic. Uh, so the dress itself, as well as the ink, uh, paint that would be used on everything from walls to furniture to children's toys, all of those contained arsenic. Uh, it was just everywhere. So the reason why is because of this gentleman right here. Uh, this is a gentleman named Carl Wilhelm Schiele. He was a chemist and he invented Schiele's green, which is copper arsenate. Uh, so before this, it was really hard to make a green that would stay green. Uh, usually you'd have to layer blue and yellow and it would kind of work, sort of, but the color would fade over time. Uh, but copper arsenate kind of changed the game. They finally had a color fast green pigment. And Carl Wilhelm Schiele sadly died at a very young age. He was, I believe, 44 when he died, uh, which was common for chemists in that era because they tended to mess around with a lot of toxic stuff and personal protective equipment hadn't really been invented yet. So he unfortunately poisoned himself somehow. Uh, but considering what he was working with, it's not terribly surprising. But as I mentioned, he came up with this stuff right here, which is called Paris Green, Schiele's Green, and it was widely used later on as an insecticide uh, for things like uh, eradicating malarial mosquitoes. Uh, the US Public Health Service ran a big malaria eradication program uh, in the first half of the 20th century to wipe out malaria in the United States. And they dusted Paris green all over everything to wipe out mosquitoes. Uh, it worked. It's not something we would consider doing today, of course, because it is highly toxic to everything it touches, not just mosquitoes. Uh, but at the time, that was a very important public health tool. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, green was very much in fashion and Sheila's green or Paris green was a very important kind of pigment. Uh, for making things like clothes and shoes, gloves, socks, everything you can think of. Uh, this particular dress right here is loaded with arsenic because it contains the Sheila's green pigment. And the problem is, is that it's not a dye. Uh, so it doesn't kind of soak into the fabric as easily. Uh, it kind of has to be dusted on and it would be put on there with some kind of a starch to kind of fix it onto the fabric. Uh, so it wouldn't adhere very well. Uh, so what would happen is uh, when a lady would be walking around with an arsenical green dress, she'd be basically shedding little particles of uh, this arsenic pigment wherever she went. So if we think about how big these dresses used to be, uh, a crinoline dress like this that has these big elaborate skirts uh, could contain about 20 yards of material or so. 
so 21 yards of material could contain up to 900 grains of arsenic. Uh, so one grain is about 65 milligrams and four to five milligrams of arsenic could be fatal to a human. Uh, so not for nothing, it was written in the British Medical Journal. Well, may the fascinating wear of this dress be called a killing creature. She actually carries in her skirts poison enough to slay half the admirers she may meet in a dozen ballrooms. Uh, so women, high-class ladies, are walking around wearing these beautiful dresses and also the artificial flowers, which also would have had arsenic pigments in them. And then you got these beautiful green shoes right here, uh, again, containing arsenic. So you'd think this would be a big problem for the wearer, but actually not so much. Like if you look at these green uh, artificial flowers here, those would be made out of wax and the arsenic uh, pigment, the Sheila's green powder would be applied to these. Uh, so if a lady's wearing this and it touches her bare shoulder, she might get a little bit of irritation on her skin. The real problem comes with the women and the girls who are making these dresses and these artificial flowers in these factories. Uh, because at the time in the 1800s, working conditions in factories did not have a high emphasis on safety. Uh, and young women and girls had very few employment options. Uh, so they had no choice but to work in these very dangerous and strenuous conditions. And I'm gonna look at one case in particular uh, this is the case of a young woman named Matilda Schroeder, who was 19 when she died, and she worked as an artificial flower maker. Uh, and she would be exposed day after day to this Sheila's green, this arsenic green pigment. Uh, so you can see this is what would be typical of these artificial flower makers when they're coming into contact with arsenic on their bare skin all the time. But they're also inhaling it. Uh, there's no real effective PP at the time. There's no respiratory protection. There are no windows in these factories very frequently. So the ventilation is very poor, no hand washing facilities. Uh, so she's very likely not only breathing it in, but she's taking it into her body when she eats food. So she's getting a constant subacute dose of arsenic all the time when she's working. Uh, and in uh, Matilda's particular case, she died in 1861. Uh, she developed these skin lesions, uh, she vomited green, the whites of her eyes turned green, and uh, she finally went into really violent convulsions before she died. And she had apparently, according to the report, been sick several times like this in the 18 months preceding her death. Uh, so it was written in the British press, under such circumstances, death is evidently about as accidental as one resulting from a railway collision occasioned by arrangements known to be faulty. Uh, so her case in particular really got a lot of attention in the British press. Uh, so as I mentioned, the ladies who were wearing these artificial flowers and these dresses, they didn't necessarily have a problem uh, with being on their skin. It was more the young women and the girls who were making the dresses, making the artificial flowers. And to their great credit, uh, upper class ladies in Britain finally realized that they were making themselves beautiful by hurting other women to do it. Uh, and they organized these sanitary societies uh, to kind of speak out for safety uh, for women in the workplace. And these uh, artificial flowers started to come out of fashion just because of what they were doing to other women. You can see here, uh, this is from the British press. Uh, and you can see this lady admiring her new crinoline dress in the mirror. But in the mirror, you can see there is the poor dressmaker who has apparently died from overwork. Uh, so that is how it would be with the dresses. But it wasn't just in the clothing. As I mentioned, arsenic had a number of applications. And one of the really big ones was arsenical wallpapers. Uh, so when gas lamps came out, uh, people no longer had to have white walls in their houses. Uh, when candles were what people were using for illumination, you really need to maintain as much light as possible in the house. So white walls would help with that. So once they had gas lamps, people could get these really elaborate wallpaper patterns uh, because the light in the house was better and you could actually see them. And it was really a status symbol to have these elaborate wallpapers in your house. The problem is they were just loaded up with arsenic. 
Uh, and this doctor here, Dr. Robert Kedzie, who was with the uh, Michigan State Board of Health, actually compiled a book called Shadows from the Walls of Death. And in it are samples of these arsenical wallpapers. Uh, so this is one example right here. And again, this all green. So this would have been loaded with arsenical pigments. Uh, and then here we go. This is another one. Again, not just the green, but probably the blue also would have contained arsenic. And these wallpapers, if you kind of look at the texture, these were called flocked wallpapers. Uh, so these are kind of textured wallpapers. The, and as with the uh, cloth, the pigment was kind of just stuck on there. So it had a tendency to come off the wallpaper. Uh, so again, here I believe some of these reds also and the oranges also contained arsenic. Uh, so it doesn't take much imagination to figure out that your room is going to eventually have just arsenic pigment dust all over the place from falling off the walls. As I mentioned, everyone knew that arsenic was poisonous, uh, but they weren't overly concerned about having it on the wall because they figured as long as you don't eat it, you'll probably be fine. Well, that was actually not the case as I'm gonna discuss. Um, so doctors really started to become concerned um, about all this poison hanging around on people's walls and on their furniture and their clothing. Uh, so by 1887, up to 65% of the wallpaper in the United States contained arsenic. Uh, so in Britain, 1857, this gentleman, uh, Jabez Hogg, who was a doctor, uh, he really starts agitating with Parliament about this issue. Uh, but the problem is, is that the very last thing the British Parliament would consent to is anything that would interfere with trade. Uh, the British were incredibly aggressively capitalist. Uh, and again, anything that would interfere with trade, Parliament was just not going to hear it. And that was very much the case uh, with our cynical wallpaper. In spite of the fact that in 1879, when they finally had a committee of inquiry, uh, there were 54 documented cases of people getting poisoned from their wallpaper in only the few weeks prior to the hearings. Uh, 24 of these cases were in the homes of actual physicians and one doctor's wife actually died. Her death was attributed to being in the room, being exposed to this arsenical wallpaper. And even the queen herself was not immune from this. Uh, there was a gentleman named Mr. E.H. Cornbold who had an appointment with Queen Victoria. Uh, so he went to stay at the queen's home and he was put in a room that was wallpapered with this arsenical green wallpaper. Uh, so during the evening, uh, Mr. Cornbold became quite ill. He became weak. He was prostrated. He was having trouble breathing, headache, dry cough, to the point that he was actually late to his meeting with Queen Victoria the following morning, uh, which was not something you did. You were not late for a meeting with Queen Victoria. Uh, so Mr. Cornbold was very apologetic. He explained what happened. He said he was afraid he was sickened by the wallpaper in the room where he'd been put. Uh, so the Queen actually investigated the matter and was so worried about it that she had all the arsenical wallpaper removed from all of her homes. Uh, so even Queen Victoria herself in her own home experienced this. So the man responsible for all this arsenical wallpaper kicking around is this gentleman named William Morris. Uh, so William Morris was very active uh, in a movement called the Arts and Crafts Movement uh, that basically encouraged people to do arts and work with their hands and do crafts in their homes. Uh, but he also was a businessman. Uh, he owned the Philip Moore, the William Morris Company, uh, which produced a lot of the wallpaper in Britain and the United States because he had perfected this technology for block printing these really elaborate prints that I've shown you. And he also owned a mine called the Devon Great Consoles, which produced massive amounts of iron. Well, I mentioned earlier that arsenic likes to hang out with other elements. Iron is one of those. Uh, so if you're mining copper, if you're mining sulfur, if you're mining tin, uh, you are probably along with that ore, you're going to get a lot of arsenic with it. So as a byproduct, large quantities of arsenic trioxide were produced. Uh, and if you look at some of these old uh, mining facilities in places like Cornwall, you'll see these things called an arsenic maze. Uh, and what would happen is the fume from the smelting process would go through this winding arsenic maze 
and then they would go in and harvest the arsenic out of the arsenic maze uh, off the walls. It crystallizes these white crystals. Uh, so what you see this gentleman shoveling here is actually white arsenic. That is arsenic trioxide. Uh, and you can see he's got his state-of-the-art protective equipment there in the form of a bandana wrapped around his face. Uh, but all that white powder you see is all white arsenic. And Devon Great Consoles produced massive quantities of it. Uh, so William Morris thought this was all in everyone's head. Uh, he said that doctors had been bitten by the witch fever and that there was nothing wrong with arsenical wallpaper and everyone was just making things up. Uh, so also I forgot, it wasn't just men working at uh, Devon Great consoles uh, with arsenic. You got these uh, like the Handmaid's Tale type outfits here that were supposed to protect these ladies from uh, shoveling up this arsenic. Uh, so again, not very conducive to long-term health of the workers working with that kind of material with no real protective equipment. So people really start to become concerned about this, particularly uh, with all these doctors in the press coming out against our cynical wallpaper. Um, and you can see right there on the left in this illustration, uh, there's the arsenic wallpaper. Uh, there's also, there's rats. Uh, there's sewer gas coming out of the drain. Uh, there is uh, the gas lamp is giving off toxic fumes. Uh, so a lot of things to be concerned about if you were a homeowner during the Victorian period. Uh, lots of ways things could go wrong in your house. And I won't even get into what it looked like when they started bringing electricity into the homes with no real idea what they were doing. That's another talk. Uh, but that, that could also be very, very dangerous. Uh, so... Eventually what starts to happen is people start demanding wallpaper that is free from arsenic. And so ultimately it wasn't acts of the British government and the American government that caused these wallpapers to be done away with. It was actually the demands of the public uh, that caused businesses like the William Morris Company to start making wallpapers that were free of arsenic uh, because people were con convinced that there was such a danger to their health. Now, no one quite understood why people would get sick from arsenical wallpaper. Um, it wasn't that the arsenic pigment was falling off the wallpaper like you would think. It turns out, and this was not discovered until much later, uh, that under the right conditions, uh, like damp sort of cool conditions like what you would have in Britain, uh, that little microorganisms in the paste, which was made from horse glue that stuck the wallpaper onto the wall. Uh, the action of those microbes could actually uh, produce trimethyl arsine, which is a gas. Uh, so people were actually becoming sick by this off-gassing of the arsenic that was in their wallpaper from the action of the microorganisms. Again, nobody could figure that out at the time. There was a, an Italian chemist named Bartolomeo Gossio uh, who in 1891 kind of sort of figured out that there was arsenic, uh, arsene gas off-gassing from the wallpaper, but nobody really understood quite why until much later. Uh, but in any case, people were ripping this out of their homes left and right. Uh, unfortunately, in some cases, all they would do is just paper over it, which wouldn't really fix the problem. Uh, so it wasn't just uh, sort of... Uh, clothing and wallpaper and that sort of thing that people were using arsenic for. Uh, at the top there in French, that means it is, you must suffer to be beautiful. There, someone just put it in the chat. In order to be beautiful, it is necessary to suffer. Uh, so women actually started using arsenic in all sorts of beauty products. Uh, and I love looking at vintage ads like this just because it's just so insane, some of the things that they would say. Uh, so this is a, an ad for uh, this French preparation of arsenic uh, called arsenic complexion wafers. Uh, so you would take these little wafers and you would eat this and it was supposed to make your skin very clear and clear up any blemishes. Uh, because the idea at the time was that if you had a tan, that meant that you were outside working. So only poor women would have a tan. Uh, so if you're a wealthy woman and you were inside all the time, uh, you would have pale skin. So that's kind of a mark of your social status is that you wouldn't have a tan. Uh, so in addition to that, you can get some arsenical lotion. 
so Mademoiselle Esme on we uh, recommends Dr. Mountbank's Arsenical Lotion. Uh, you want to make sure to get the expensively perfumed variety. Uh, very important. Uh, Dr. McKenzie's Arsenical Soap, again, same principle. Uh, you apply the arsenic directly to your skin and it will clear up any skin blemishes or any problems like that that you have and keep you with a nice pale complexion. Uh, and you didn't necessarily have to buy one of these products. Uh, a lot of women would just simply go and buy fly paper, uh, which contained arsenic, and they would soak the fly paper to extract the arsenic out and then use the water from that uh, on their skin and get the same kind of effect. And this one, this product, Dr. James Campbell's Safe Arsenic Complexion Wafers, you could actually order from the Sears catalog. Uh, you wanna make sure you accept no substitutes when getting your arsenic. Uh, so again, what's going on with all the eating of the arsenic? Uh, so there was this article in the Illustrated London News in 1873 about these peasants in Austria, this place called Styria. And the story goes is that all of the women were very beautiful and they had these beautiful figures and the men were all very strong and manly uh, and they had great endurance for running up and down the mountains in Austria. And the reason behind it all was they would eat arsenic. Um, and this was widely not believed. Nobody actually thought that these people were actually eating arsenic. Uh, well, actually, it was observed by British doctors that they would actually do this. They would take a piece of that metallic arsenic, like I showed you at the beginning, and they would actually swallow that. Well, see, the thing of it is, here's what it is with arsenic. Um, arsenic compounds vary in toxicity. Uh, arsenic trioxide is extremely toxic, uh, but there are other uh, organic compounds of arsenic that are less toxic, and then pure arsenic is not very readily absorbed by the body. So that could explain why these people were able to eat these pieces of arsenic uh, and be okay, is they were eating this metallic arsenic. Um, so that's one possible explanation. Uh, and it is possible to build up a little bit of a tolerance to it over time. Um, but this kind of set off this kind of arsenic craze where people were determined that Taking in arsenic could make them look good and it was good for their general health. Uh, and that brings us to this next case here, the case of Florence Maybrick in 1889. Uh, so this case was a great scandal in Britain uh, for reasons that I'm gonna go into. And you can see here in this kind of British crime tabloid, uh, so Florence Maybrick was accused of murdering her husband. Uh, so, uh, her husband was, by all accounts, not a very good guy. Uh, he beat her. He was uh, just generally not an ideal spouse. Uh, so not surprisingly, probably, and this is Florence here in the dock. Uh, and then let's go get a look at her husband. Uh, so this is James Maybrick. And James was in the trade business, uh, kind of handled business between Norfolk and Liverpool. Uh, so Florence gets married to this guy and then things start to go bad. And eventually he announces to her that he's got very, very serious money problems. Uh, so shortly after he makes the announcement he's having money problems, he begins to get sick and eventually dies. Uh, so it's found out also, incidentally, that she was having an affair with this gentleman, Albert Brierley. Uh, so... She is eventually suspected of, mur of uh, murdering her husband by poisoning with arsenic. She's arrested, she's brought to trial, uh, and it all comes down to a bottle of Valentine's meat juice. Uh, so a nurse who had been hired to take care of the husband during his long illness testified that she saw uh, Florence Maybrick uh, take this bottle of Valentine's meat juice out of the sick room and then bring it back a little later on. And then after that, the husband became more ill. So the bottle of Valentine's meat juice was tested and it was found to contain arsenic, as was the body of Mr. Maybrick found to contain arsenic. Uh, so her defense was that her husband was a very vain man 
and he took arsenic himself for his appearance and for his vitality. He believed it was good for his health. Uh, so just as a little side note here, I'm sure we have all heard of the Valentine Museum for those of us who live here in Richmond. Uh, but Valentine's meat juice was a very common preparation that would be given to people who were essentially invalids who were sick. Uh, and it was basically a concentration of meat juice. It sounds horrible, uh, but apparently a lot of people bought into it because the Valentine's uh, meat juice company made a lot of money off of it. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, it was determined to contain arsenic. So it was determined that Valentine's meat juice was the murder weapon. Uh, was it actually Florence who did the crime? It's questionable. Um, the problem is uh, that there was not a small amount of misogyny in play here. Uh, the fact that a woman had had an affair was absolutely scandalous in Victorian society. And indeed, the judge actually just went on a tirade against Florence from the bench uh, for like half an hour, uh, just berating her for having had an affair and having betrayed her husband. Uh, she was convicted and sentenced to prison, but she uh, was eventually released. Uh, she, her health failed, so she uh, got compassionate uh, release from prison. So there is evidence she may indeed have been guilty, but again, uh, the, the deck was kind of stacked against her anyway, just because of the attitudes at the time. So I think it's hard to say one way or the other whether she was actually guilty. So I'm going to touch on uh, some accidental uh, arsenic poisonings here at the end. Let me see how much time I've got. Oh, yeah, plenty of time. Uh, you know what, I'll go ahead and pause for questions right here. I got a little bit of time. If you have any questions, go ahead and throw those in the chat. Okay, so we did have the question, uh, were the maids of fancy ladies prone to poisoning from their clothes uh, or their artificial flowers, things like that? It doesn't seem like so much from the wearing of the artificial flowers. It seems like the bigger threat to people's health uh, was the arsenic wallpaper in their homes. Uh, but very frequently, children would get accidentally poisoned uh, for reasons that I'm about to go into here in this next section. I don't see anything popping up here in the chat. Ah, what about children's deaths during these times? Okay. This is going to lead me, that question is going to lead me very nicely into my next section here. Uh, so if you look at the illustration here, what you see is this is death as a candy maker. Uh, so death is working away here, blending together the ingredients. And you see on the right there is a box of plaster of Paris and on the left is a barrel of arsenic. And here is why those two particular items are featured here with death making the candy. Uh, so 1858, uh, October 30th of 1858, uh, there was a candy maker, uh, who actually, uh, received an order from a sweet seller to make him some peppermint lozenges. Uh, the candy maker sent his apprentice over to the pharmacy to get some plaster of Paris. Now you may ask, why would someone need plaster of Paris to make peppermint lozenges? And the answer is because sugar was very expensive. So it was very, very common at the time to use what would be called DAF. Uh, so what you do is you would take your sugar, you'd mix it with something like plaster of Paris or bone dust or something like that to make your sugar go a little bit further so you could make more product. So then you could in turn make more profit. Uh, so the candy maker apprentice goes off to the pharmacy and the pharmacist was sick, but he got the pharmacist apprentice uh, and the pharmacist told his apprentice, look, just go in the storeroom. There's a big barrel full of white powder. Just weigh that out and, uh, and send him on his way which he did. Uh, so the apprentice candy maker comes back to the candy maker shop with this big bundle of white powder, which they thought was plaster of Paris. Uh, so they make uh, 40 pounds worth of peppermints. And then they give that to the candy seller who then puts it out in his stall the following day, October 31st, 1858. Uh, so he starts selling these off. And very shortly thereafter, people started becoming violently ill. Uh, so eventually, uh, at first, of course, they thought it was cholera or foodborne illness or something like that, but the pattern was very odd. It wouldn't be everyone in the family getting sick. It would be just the children and a few other people becoming ill. 
so eventually they figured out that it was these peppermint lozenges. They traced it back to the candy seller and traced it back from there to the candy maker and then to the pharmacy. And then they figured out that what had happened was that instead of plaster of Paris, uh, the pharmacy had sold white arsenic. Uh, so each one of these lozenges contained about 14 grains of arsenic. Uh, so you may remember from earlier that about four to five grains of arsenic I will typically kill someone. Uh, so in the end, about 20 people did die. Most of those were children uh, and about 200 people became ill. It could be more than that um, because again, it was really hard to specifically determine what had caused someone's death in those particular times, especially because the medical profession was not quite as developed as it is right now. A lot of times the coroner was not even a doctor. Again, this was a big sensation in the press, and this became known as the Bradford Sweet Poisoning because this occurred in Bradford, England. Uh, so this was not an isolated incident. It was very common for uh, confectioners, like say if they were making like a little sugar decoration to go on top of a cake, they might use Paris green to color that under the assumption that nobody would eat it. Uh, there was one uh, instance where the Irish regiment had a party and they had a cake with these decorations on it uh, that were made from solid pieces of sugar that had the arsenical green pigment on them. And they actually, some of them took those decorations home to their children and some children were actually poisoned. Um, so arsenic was very easy to mistake for other things. It would be mistaken for sugar, it would be mistaken for flour or baking powder. Uh, so uh, accidental poisons with arsenic were not uncommon, as it was also not uncommon for people to be deliberately poisoned with arsenic. Uh, but at a time when food safety and uh, authenticity of ingredients and the purity of food was not really so much of a thing, um, food adulteration was extremely common. So situations like this, one I've just talked about, the one I'm about to talk about, uh, could easily happen. Uh, so this is uh, the gentleman there on the left holding up the hop tea. That's John Bull. Uh, so John Bull was kind of this caricature who was supposed to be a representation of the British public. Um, so John Bull is talking to this gentleman over here on the right who's a brewer. And he's saying that uh, I'm going to from now on uh, make my tea with hops because your beer is so poor that it's not worthy of having my hops in it. Uh, so... This is as a result uh, of, again, all kinds of adulteration that was happening with beer, among other products. Uh, the British were very serious about their beer at the time, and they still are. Uh, but it was very common for beer to be adulterated with all sorts of things. And in the case I'm about to talk about, it had fatal consequences. Uh, so this is a case that happened in Manchester in 1900. And uh, what doctors started noticing? is they started noticing people with these dark patches on their skin. And they got other sorts of symptoms that at first they put them down to alcoholic neuritis. Uh, so Manchester had a reputation of being a very, very hard drinking town. Uh, so them seeing alcohol related illnesses like alcoholic neuritis was not uncommon for physicians in Manchester to see that. Uh, but in 1900, they start seeing a large number of cases and they start seeing them in very young children, which really seemed odd. Uh, these were not uh, people that were old enough to have developed very serious alcohol related illness from years and years of drinking. Uh, so they start to look a little closer and they start to notice some other odd things besides like these dark patches on the skin like this child has. Uh, they would see lesions on the feet. Uh, like this, which was also not something associated with alcoholic neuritis. Uh, so the doctors are trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, so eventually somebody did some figuring out and they looked at one of the victims who was a 12 year old girl and they found out that her father owned a tavern. And it was very common for uh, patrons of the tavern to give her little sips of beer. And the specific kind of beer was four penny ale. So it was pretty much the cheapest beer that was on offer. Uh, so what they determined was that something in the beer had caused this child to be poisoned. 
So again, some investigation ensued. They looked at other taverns, at least 11 other taverns uh, in Manchester. And what they eventually found out was that the beer was to blame. Here's how it happened. Uh, so beer should be made traditionally with malted barley, water, hops, and yeast. And that's it. Uh, but the particular brewery that was making this cheap beer that was in these taverns, they were kind of cheating a little bit. Uh, so they were using glucose instead of malted barley. And the process that was extracting the glucose from the sugar cane used sulfuric acid, which had been contaminated with arsenic. So as a result of that, the glucose was contaminated with arsenic, and so the beer was contaminated with arsenic. So what was happening is when these people were drinking beer, they were getting doses of arsenic that were not sufficient to really kill them but they were getting these subacute doses of arsenic over a long period of time. And this is the kind of symptoms that they would see as a result. Dark patches on the skin, the lesions on the feet, uh, the numbness. Uh, so uh, tingling and pain in the extremities, muscle atrophy, a difficulty walking, confusion. Um, so sadly, uh, in modern times, in uh, third world countries where there have been initiatives to dig wells so people can have access to clean water. Uh, a lot of the, uh, there have been several cases where uh, the wells have actually gone through rock strata that contain arsenic compounds. Uh, so people have actually gotten subacute doses of arsenic through their drinking water. Uh, so it's kind of horribly ironic that in a quest to bring people clean water, they've actually been subjected to arsenic poisoning. Uh, but in Manchester, uh, at least 70 people died, about 6,000 more were affected uh, as a result of drinking this cheap arsenic laced beer. Uh, so this was one of the many things that uh, resulted in food safety laws here and in Britain. Uh, the continent was much more strict uh, with their laws and with how arsenic could be sold and how it could be used. Uh, so on the European continent, it was less of a problem. It was much more of a problem in uh, Britain and in the U.S. Because we didn't have really strong food safety laws on the books until the early 1900s. And even that one, the Pure Food and Drug Law of 1906, wasn't that strong. Um, but so again, a problem here and in Britain. I mentioned earlier that arsenic had medicinal uses, but it was possible in Britain and in the US, you could walk right into a pharmacy and just order yourself a few pounds of arsenic and a bottle of laudanum to go. And you could send your little daughter off to get that for you. Uh, so why would a pharmacy be selling liquid arsenic? Well, because it did have some medicinal uses. Uh, it could be useful for treating skin conditions. Um, the problem was is doctors started using it for all sorts of things and became convinced that the arsenic was helping uh, on the principle that uh, if a patient is sick and the doctor gives them some arsenical medication then the patient becomes well it must have been the arsenic. Uh, ignoring the fact that very often even if the doctor had done nothing the patient would have gotten well anyway. Uh, but they became, that could be, they became convinced that arsenic had medicinal purposes. It was like this magic bullet. Uh, so again, you can see this person has taken a dose of medicinal arsenic and it is, is not at all worked out, but you have to remember that at the time, a lot of patients expected for the cure to give them very unpleasant side effects. Uh, so it would not have been shocking for someone to take some medication and then feel ill. So again, it's liquid arsenical medication, but there's the principle that the dose makes the poison. So uh, you could use it as a medication, and as long as you didn't give someone too much. <clears throat> so again, granules of arsenious acid. Uh, I love this one. You got your chocolate-coated tablet, tablets of iron, arsenic, and strychnine. Uh, the chocolate coating makes it go down easier, apparently. Uh, but you got your uh, arsenic and your strychnine, uh, which was uh, the strychnine was supposed to be good for endurance. But again, you want to make sure you get the chocolate-coated ones. And this is some stuff called Fowler Solution. Uh, so this was created by this doctor named Thomas Fowler in the late 1700s, uh, who was trying to duplicate this patent medicine that was used for fevers. Uh, 
Uh, and he came up with this arsenical containing stuff called Fowler's solution, which was used all the way up until the early 20th century for skin conditions. But people would use it for all kinds of stuff. They treated Fowler's solution like it was some kind of a magic bullet. Uh, but in reality, it was probably doing just as much harm to the patient as the actual health condition they were trying to treat. Now, this is one case where arsenic actually had value as a medicine. Uh, this is a kit uh, for a drug called Salversan. And Salversan was invented by a doctor named Paul Ehrlich uh, in 1909. Uh, and this was for treating syphilis, which was, before that, it was treated with mercury, uh, which did not have great side effects. Uh, now, using salversan, which was an arsenical-containing medication, it had to be taken for a year. It didn't have great side effects either, but it was better than being treated with mercury. Uh, and it actually worked fairly well until antibiotics came along. I'm going to go ahead and start answering some questions. And while I'm doing that, here are my references. Uh, if any of you would like to review any of these books, uh, King of Poisons, A History of Arsenic is great. Um, the George Wythe book up on top by Bruce Chadwick, if you're interested in some local history, uh, the George Wythe book is excellent. Um, and the John Emsley book, Elements of Murder, History of Poison, uh, that's another great book. Uh, I've had people come into my house and look at my collection of books and then kind of nervously ask if they had anything to worry about, to which I respond, well, if you do, it's probably already too late. Okay, so let's look at some of the questions here. Is arsenic still a problem displaying and handling historical garments? Yes, it is. Uh, in museums and libraries that have things like uh, books with arsenical pigments in them. Uh, like there are copies of the book Shadows of the Walls of Death. Um, those books are very carefully kept. Um, you have to have special permission to handle them. Um, so yes, a great deal of caution is used in modern times when handling these artifacts that do contain arsenic. Were the eyes turning green a result of the pigment or the arsenic? Uh, so the eyes turn colors from just the arsenic. I am not a physician or a toxicologist, so I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, so I'd, I'd be guessing. Um, but the arsenic itself is not green. It's the copper arsenate pigment that's green. Uh, but again, I don't know the physiological reason behind that particular reaction. So I couldn't say one way or the other. Are there lasting long-term effects of, of uh, small arsenic poison? Yes, like the case of the beer poison, yes. Um, Unfortunately, in cases in modern times where people have been poisoned uh, by doses of arsenic in their water, um, yes, there are lasting, uh, that, that damage is in many cases uh, uh, chronic. Is arsenic still used in anything today? Yes, it is. Uh, arsenic does have some applications with electronics manufacture today. Not nearly as many industrial applications as it used to have. Uh, it was used in everything from glass making to making lead shot. Uh, as I mentioned before, it was in a lot of different pigments. Um, so arsenic was used for a lot of things uh, back in the day. And it's kind of a principle of industry that when you have a lot of something, you tend to find uses for it. Uh, and producing iron and steel, which they produced a lot of during the Industrial Revolution in Britain, that produced a lot of arsenic. Uh, so they needed to find some sort of a use for that. Um, but it's, um, it's used in a few industrial processes today, but not very much. Uh, is arsenic pigment only sat on the clothes was a risk in the washing and laundering of the garments, or were these garments just not washed? Um, the types of fabrics, it would have been difficult to just wash them. It would have been like stuff that today we would only dry clean, um, so it would have been typical at the time to just probably just brush dirt off of the fabric uh, with a stiff brush. Uh, so yeah, that definitely probably could have liberated some of the arsenic pigment off the material. Uh, do you think people in 100 years will look back at us using industrial dyes today and wonder what we were thinking? Uh, yeah, probably. I think we definitely look back 100 years and say, what were people thinking? Uh, so I have no doubt that people do the same thing for us. Um, it's, uh, it's worth noting that uh, also in addition to these arsenical dyes, what took their place uh, 
were aniline dyes, which were made from coal tar, which were also very toxic. Uh, and aniline dyes were used in clothing. Um, and those could also turn up in food products also. Like uh, before the Pure Food and Drug Act, uh, if you bought a jar of, say, strawberry preserves, uh, you might get apple peels and nigella seeds and red coal tar dye and sugar being sold as strawberry jam. Uh, and that's, again, that's a whole other talk. That's one I actually did called I Wonder What's In It, which I think is on our YouTube playlist. So um, if you want to hear more about coal tar dyes, you can definitely pull that one up on YouTube. Okay, we have a question. Uh, novels in 1900 referred occasionally to arsenical eyes or arsenical bags under the eyes. Was this the result of arsenic poisoning? Again, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, Arsenic can cause all kinds of weird physiological effects, depending on the person, depending on the dosage, depending on the tolerance. Uh, again, with me not being a physician or a toxicologist, I really couldn't say one way or the other. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and bring it to a close today. We're just about out of time. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, please join us next week on Wednesday, August the 25th at noon for Hunting Dinosaurs, presented by Tim Shulpertum, Director of Playful Learning and Inquiry here at the Science Museum of Virginia. You can register for next week's talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend and is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Thank you all for joining us.